Okay. Um, I think we're live. Uh, great. Hello, folks. Good morning, everybody. So this is our final uh, screen side chat, and uh, we have some guests uh, with us. Uh, we'll have some more in a moment. Um, so um, 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 let's see. Let's start with some uh, maybe logistics. Yeah, I guess we're finally in the last week of the course, pretty much, and so you. Hope you've been enjoying it all. Uh, I guess the last problem set is due this weekend, is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, Sunday night. And then the final will be going out. And uh, we decided on, uh, I guess, a two-week deadline for the final. So we'll have a extended, little bit of extension on that. Right. So there were some requests for people who were going on travel and so on. So we decided to give you two weeks rather than one week to do it. Of course, remember that once you start doing it, you have uh, just, was it four hours? Three? Four hours, I think, to complete it. But you'll have a two-week window with, uh, during which to do that. Um, any other uh, logistics that we need to... Oh, this is one thing. Uh, there will be a survey going out. This is, as we all know, an experiment, first time for us as well as you, and we'd like to learn from it, see what's working well, what can be improved. And so a survey will go out, and we would really appreciate it if you could answer it. Uh, and go out uh, probably st uh, already uh, and later this week, man, or maybe uh, next week is when we will go out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other logistics? I think that covers it. Uh, things seem to be working pretty smoothly now in the forums and everything, so uh, yeah, nothing particular. Good. Um, so uh, as people join us to the Hangout, uh, I ask that you make sure that your mic is muted. Um, the, if people don't have uh, um, uh, microphones, uh, then uh, we may ask you uh, to excuse yourself later on so people who do can come and interact, but right now we're okay. And so we're, uh, this is going to be a slightly longer uh, uh, speed side chat, and we're going to uh, structure it in the following way. First, uh, both Matt and I wanted to uh, just give you a mini lecture on material we haven't covered, things that are a little more cutting edge and current, um, and uh, we'll start with that. Um, I'll start uh, with about a 10 minute mini lecture and then Matt will uh, follow up. We then have two distinguished guests with us today and we will keep their identity secret for now. Uh, we'll introduce them uh, shortly and we will have a 10 minute segments with each of those. Then we'll open up for a discussion with you all and then we'll Congratulate each, uh, all of us on, uh, on a good course and beyond. So uh, several people have joined. Uh, hello, James. Hello, Julia. Hello, Dimitris. Please, all of you, mute your mics until it's time to speak. Okay? Thank you very much. Okay, let's get going. Uh, I will start, uh, we agreed, with my mini lecture. and. Um, let me go and screen share uh, the following screen. Okay. Um, so, uh, can you just make sure that you see my screen okay? It's okay? All right. But tell me if you still see it okay now. When I go full screen, does it, does it show okay? Does it go full screen? It's the same. It's the same. Uh, and when I do this, does does the uh, slide change or not? No. Uh huh. So I need to share a different screen. What I need to do is <laughs> bear with me. I'm just a computer scientist. What do I know about technology? Um, Okay, I'll, 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 I'll mm, no, I do want to go full screen, so bear with me for just a second here. I'll, I'll unscreen share, and then I'll try to share a different screen, which is my desktop. Is 
So please, nobody. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I hope you all appreciate the joke going on here with the rec <laughs> recursive rendition. But uh, in just a moment, all will be good, I think. So can you see my uh, my slide there, Eric? All right. And has the slide changed now? Yes? Yes. OK. Here we go. So I will speak about computational issues in game theory, uh, something that's been a very hot topic in computer science. And my colleagues, uh, Kostas Deskalakis from MIT, it's not it's on the East Coast, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And uh, my colleague Kevin Leighton Brown from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver uh, agreed to share some of the material to, uh, that I'm going to use here. So I thank them very much. Um, I want to speak about how we, as we saw, so much of uh, our discussion of game theory hinges on Nash equilibrium and, and, and various versions of it. And uh, big, there are uh, many computational issues surrounding Nash equilibrium, and I want to speak about that. And then I want to speak about a related thing about a, a new, uh, new genre of game representations that are inspired by computational issues. So let's go. Uh, early history of, of, of computation. Early on, John von Neumann, uh, when, they, when he proved the uh, existence of the equilibrium in zero-sum games, uh, really uh, used a, a method that uh, naturally gives rise to computational methods. And in particular, oh. it, can be, uh, it can be represented at a linear program. Sorry to interrupt, but you're not on the main screen. We don't see anything. Uh, but do you see the slides? No. Uh -huh. yeah, I see the slides. Oh, you see I the see the slides. Oh, okay. I see the slides. Okay, thank you all. Uh, Amit uh, Saberi, you will need to uh, compensate with really good hearing. Um, so let me continue. Um, and, uh, and as was discovered in the, the late 70s, uh, linear programming is solvable in polynomial time. And, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, you might want to uh, mute your mic. Uh, in fact, everybody might want to again check that your mic is muted. So um, we know that uh, zero-sum games are solvable in polynomial time. Uh, when Nash proved uh, the existence of equilibrium for general-sum games, the story was very different. Um, he, uh, his, 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 his method, which was also uh, based on, on, on Barr's fixed point, did not give rise to a linear program, but to what is called a linear complementarity program, and that does not admit uh, linear time solution. In fact, there are many attempts to come up with algorithms. Uh, let me give you a sense for these algorithms. Again, we're going to do a quick flyby to give you a sense for the space. Um, here are two algorithms. The best known one uh, is uh, the one uh, by Lemke and Housen. And it directly took, it's a, it's a rather sophisticated algorithm, an algorithm that has intimate understanding of the linear complementarity program and based on a method for solving it, which is similar to the method of solving a linear program using a pivoting procedure, except the pivoting procedure uh, in the case of linear complementarity is more complicated. And uh, the algorithm is not only not provably uh, polynomial, it's provably exponential uh, in the worst case. Uh, but uh, sort of a bedrock of computation of Nash equilibrium in, in normal form games. Much more recently, um, in fact, here at Stanford, uh, a, a very uh, naive uh, algorithm uh, was presented that's also complete and exponential in the worst case, but uh, experimentally shown uh, to work uh, better than lemke hausen And uh, it's interesting to understand why. And if you fix the support of the, uh, of the, uh, of the strategies of the players, meaning you fix the strategies that are played with non-zero probability, and you ask yourself, does there exist a national equilibrium with that, those supports? The question, again, is a linear program is easily solvable. 
The problem, of course, is that there is an exponential number of supports to explore, which makes the, the algorithm uh, uh, exponential in the worst case. But uh, if you search the, state of the sets of supports uh, cleverly, experimentally, it seems to work uh, quite well. Those are examples of algorithms that have been uh, used. And as I say, they're both exponential in the worst case. And the question is, can we do better? And that takes us from discussion of algorithms to complexity. So let's remind ourselves what computational complexity is. And um, in computer science, we have many classes of problems. And here are just a small mm -hmm. set of them. Uh, our, the class P is a class of polynomially uh, solvable problems. And, um, and uh, these, uh, excuse me, and these are uh, problems for which uh, you are guaranteed to have a solution in polynomial time. The class MP is the class, uh, it's, it's a larger class, it's a class that a problem for which a solution can be verified in polynomial time but not necessarily found in polynomial time. And it's a big, uh, probably the biggest question in computer science is whether the two classes are the same. It's white, widely believed they're not, but no proof exists. For every class of problems, in particular for the NP class, we find a subset called the complete, in this case, the NP complete problems. These are, in a sense, the problems of the hardest within that class. And specifically, it means that every problem in NP can be reduced in polynomial time to, the, uh, uh, to the, uh, any problem in the in NP complete classes. So this is kind of a snapshot of a, a subset of the complexity hierarchy. So is it NP complete to find? Uh, we believe that it's hard to find a Nash equilibrium. We can try to relate it to the class NP. And strictly speaking, the answer is no, because there's no question whether a solution exists. We know that there's a Nash equilibrium. But if we try to find anything more uh, about a Nash equilibrium, for example, uh, are there, is there more than one? Or um, a Nash equilibrium with specific properties, such as a Nash equilibrium in which the uh, sum player strategy has a bit zero in a certain location, that becomes NP hard. But that still leaves open the question of how hard is it to find a natural equilibrium? And here is a very interesting kind of sequence of uh, developments. And a new class was introduced by Papa Dimitriou in 94 called PPAD. Very quickly, uh, what this is, uh, it's a special case of TFNP, uh, which is a special case of FNP. Let me just explain briefly what those are. The class F and P are very, really constructive versions of the NP problem. So for example, uh, in an NP problem, we might ask, if I give you a logical uh, formula, is it satisfiable? And the answer is yes or no. Whereas the constructive version would say, show, show me if it is satisfiable, show me a, a, a solution. The class T, F, and P are the uh, T stands for total is the class of, uh, uh, of FNP problems where you know there is a solution. PPAD is a further specialization where the solution is based on a parity argument. And just to give you a sense for what it is, is uh, the, you have a directed graph. And you'll say that the node is balanced if its in degree is equal to its out degree. That is, the number of incoming edges it is the same as the number of outgoing edges. If your proof of the uh, exists of, of if your solution to the uh, to the answer is based on tracing the uh, unbalanced nodes, then uh, this is called a parity argument and brings you into the PPAD class. This is to give you a sense for things, but it turns out that uh, first of all. The PPAD class lives sort of in between P and NP. Again, we don't know that P and NP are different. And if they're not, then obviously PPAD is identical also. We believe they're different and that PPAD lives in between. We don't know that for a fact. 
And when we ask about uh, the complexity, uh, we can show that, in fact, the Nash equilibrium is complete for that class, PPAD complete. That was shown in a sequence of developments first for four-player uh, games, or games with four or more players, then improved to three-player games, and then finally for any, uh, any game. That is a discussion of complexity in algorithms. Um, again, a big topic that can be uh, delved in in more detail. Let me uh, give you a sense for a complementary strand of work that's also computational in nature. And um, that says that games have more structure than an arbitrary payoff matrix and arbitrary game. And therefore can be represented more compactly and reasoned about more efficiently. So uh, my colleague Kevin Layton Brown is a professor uh, in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia, and he likes coffee. Here's a map of coffee uh, shops uh, in Vancouver. This gives rise to a bunch of games one could be playing. Here's some coffee games you could play. Suppose I want to just go to a coffee shop, and I like uncrowded coffee shops. Where should I go to? Well, I have a strategy space. Choose any of them. So does everybody else. We have a game on our hands. It uh, turns out that this is a very nice instance of uh, congestion games uh, that were introduced uh, early in the 70s, where my payoff depends not so much on the identity of people and uh, just uh, everybody gets to choose a location, and my payoff depends on the number of people, not the identity of the people who chose my location. And they have very special properties. For example, every congestion game have a pure, have a pure strategy, Nash equilibrium, and so on and so forth. Um, here's a different game we could play. Uh, I might want to, uh, uh, I'm a shop owner, and I want to set prices. But if I set the prices too high and my neighbors don't, then everybody will go to my neighbors. I don't care about the remote people, uh, but I care about my neighbors. Well. Um, Oh, I see that. Okay, here are my so uh, my 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 nodes in the game here show up. The arcs don't show up. But suppose this is my. I hope you can see my mouse. This is where I'm. Uh, my coffee shop. I care about my neighbors over here and their prices, but not people uh, far off. And so uh, my uh, utility is based on. The, uh, the price set by my neighbors, but not anybody far off. That gives a right to what's called a graphical game. Um, and action right graph games are uh, another example. And here it might be, a, I want to open a coffee shop. And the question is, where should I set up shop? And uh, I can choose to not open a coffee shop. Or if I do, I need to choose a location. First of all, some locations are better than others. And secondly, some locations are have more competition because of neighbors. So in a sense, action graph games generalize both congestion games and, um, and graphical games. They, again, all of those have special properties. They can be very compact to represent, and in some cases, also easier to reason about than uh, arbitrary uh, games in, in normal work. Maybe that's all I'll say. Uh, let me now uh, attempt to go back to here. And uh, turn it over to, to Matt. Uh, we spoke about uh, games with graphs. Oh. You'd be dealing with very large graphs. Yeah, definitely. So, so as you was, was pointing out, there's a lot of games that have a, a good amount of structure, which allows us to reason through them uh, more easily. And, and in fact, game theory in terms of applications has a wide range of applications that we've seen in the course. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, a particular one that I've been working on, which has to do with social connections between individuals and how that affects their behaviors. So as you have pulls up the slides here. Um, um, which, is this what we want? No. no. Let's see. Let's, do the, let's see. This one? Yeah. All right. Share screen. 
No, I think we're sh actually sh sharing the screen, right? Okay. Oh, no, actually, you're right. All right, folks, sorry. We'll be there in a second. Um, right. so okay, so people can see the slide there? Yeah. Okay, great. So, so th this, you know, as you have just mentioned, graphical games are games where you interact with people on a local basis, so you care about what your neighbors do. And, uh, you know, there's many applications, things like uh, which products I purchase depend on my friends, so which, uh, which I, whether I get educated, whether I smoke, uh, what opinions I have. There's a whole series of behaviors that are heavily influenced by peers, and network structure matters in that. Um, so let me just talk about a particular application, uh, which is a graphical game in the sense that uh, uh, Yoab was just mentioning, and this has to do with decisions to drop out of the labor force. So. Um, you know, do I stay, am I going to be somebody who's looking for a job or am I somebody who's not looking for a job? I'm, uh, uh, I, I could be uh, uh, unemployed, I could be a student, I could be um, uh, actually uh, in other parts of the economy. The thing on your screen here is just actually census data from U.S. on males uh, 25 to 55. And it basically tells you the percentage of people over the years that are out of the labor force, um, meaning that they've decided they're, they're not looking for jobs actively. They're either in, uh, they could be in, uh, unemployed or they could be in, in other situations. Uh, and they range from three to up to uh, almost 13%. And actually the numbers are larger now if you go to 2000 and 2010. Uh, so the, you know, the difference here, you see a widening gap between whites and blacks. And so we might try and understand, you know, does game theory tell us something about why that would be there and why it might be growing and why it would be more persistent? And so let me just mention a few things here. Um, yeah. So your decision to, to drop out depends on your friends. So, you know, you have friends who are role models. You have friends who give you information about being in uh, the returns to jobs. They might also, if you're going to be in a criminal activity, they might entice you to be a criminal. Um, there's social support. There's all kinds of reasons that my decision of whether or not I'm going to be employed depends on my friends' decisions. And so then we can model that as a, as a large game. And here I've got a picture of uh, a social network of actual friendships. This is just from a high school in the U.S. Um, and when you look at this group, uh, these groups here, what you see is uh, uh, 255 students coded by racial uh, composition. So here the blue nodes are black students, the yellow nodes are white students. And what you notice from this graph is that the friendships that they have tend to be within their own race. So there's a high segregation by, by race. And indeed, if you look at the numbers behind this graph, you know, 52% of the students are white, yet 86% of their friendships are with other whites. 38% of the students are black, but 85% of their friendships are with other blacks. So you end up with uh, a game where um, people are highly segregated. And so um, we can represent that as a, you know, a simple game. That's known as homophily in the literature. And so this is a graphical game now where the nodes are players, and they're going to be making a decision. And uh, let's suppose that we start with a, a situation where there's two, two people who have dropped out of the labor force. And let's suppose that what I do is I drop out if at least half my neighbors do. Right? So we can just solve this using simple best, best response behavior, as we've seen in our course. What would I do? Well, if you look here, you know, these two people have dropped out. The, the node at the very bottom there in the middle has two friends, two out of three friends who have dropped out. They're going to choose to drop out. So now you've got, you know, the, the node in the, the yellow node in the middle now has two out of three friends who have dropped out, right? So they decide to drop out. And you can see how this begins to cascade. And the interesting thing is it cascades, but the fact that there's homophily, which splits the graph in two, so that means that you'll end up with one of the groups with a high dropout rate, the other group without a high dropout rate. And you can begin to understand how these things are going to move what kinds of contagions you get by using game theoretic tools. 
and then you can go on to, to things like you know policy prescriptions. Um, it tells you different things about how you might uh, uh, go to policy. Um, you know, so for instance, if you targeted very specific nodes in this graph, if you targeted the one with the red X early on, you could stop the dropout uh, from, from starting. And so you know, it gives you an idea of how policy might work in, in uh, these kinds of settings. So you know, this, kind, this is just a very particular application of a graphical game, but uh, that, that pretty much gives you an idea of, of what we might get from you know, thinking about game theory. And it gives you different policy prescriptions. It tells you that certain targeted kinds of policies could be very powerful. Um, so I hope that, you know, that these two examples uh, give you some idea of, uh, of the kinds of things that, that the, you know, the wide range of game theoretic applications and uh, uh, things that, that are helped by understanding this. Awesome. So uh, this is really fascinating stuff. Um, also fascinating is Professor Halvarian. Um, uh, uh, Hal is a renowned prof economist and professor at various places, most recently at, at Berkeley and even more recently at Google, where, among other things, he helped uh, design the uh, Google uh, uh, keyword auctions. And so um, uh, Hal was uh, gracious enough to join us today. It's really a unique opportunity to hear a little bit from uh, a, somebody who's at the forefront of both the theory and practice of game theory. So Hal, welcome. Thank you. Uh, why are you not jumping to the forefront? We can hear you well, but I don't see your picture showing well, up in the middle. How's that? Is that better? Yes, here you are. Okay. Hal, tell us a little bit about the uh, Google Keyword Auctions. What was the thought behind it? How did game theory play a role? And what have you learned from it? <laughs> well, the Keyword Auction actually started in the uh, fall of 2001. Uh, Google had been selling ads, but the pricing of those ads was set by the sales force. And they soon realized that there were so many different possible keywords that you could never keep up with the uh, expansion of keywords using uh, set prices, so they decided to uh, move to an auction. So during the fall of 2001, uh, Eric Veach and Salar Kamangar worked on developing an auction for the uh, Google advertising system. Now, I came in uh, in May of 2002. Actually, I just checked my email. My first visit to uh, Google was actually April 25th, 2002, so it's my 10-year anniversary. And uh, at that visit, I asked Eric, what should I do? And he said, why don't you take a look at this ad auction? I think it might make us a little money. Did it? <laughs> yes, it did. He was he was quite uh, quite right in that. Uh, but it is, I think, interesting that even at that time in 2002, Google was unsure about what its uh, business model would be. The ad auction was one of the choices, but it wasn't the uh, wasn't the only choice. It turned out that was the uh, most successful choice. And I think it's a lesson to all startups: keep your options flexible you may end up doing something quite different than what you started out doing. And so, how, let's ask, how, how did game theoretic reasoning or, or did, did your training in economics and game theory help you at all in, in terms of uh, thinking about how to structure this? And oh, yeah, ab absolutely. The first thing I did is I, uh, I, I looked at the auction that had been set up and I solved out for the Bayes-Nash equilibrium. And it turns out that's quite uh, straightforward to do. And you get the usual um, results from a single item auction carry over to the multiple item auction that Google was using. But the trouble with that derivation, even though it was intellectually interesting, is it didn't have a lot of empirical content. At least I didn't understand the empirical content uh, contained in that approach. So a few weeks later, I realized you were much better off looking at the Nash equilibrium. Uh, <clears throat> and then you ended up with uh, something that was much more uh, testable. 
Now, you ended up with a, uh, a, an auction design that is similar but different to familiar auction format. Can you tell us about that? Sure. The idea in the Google auction, what happens is there are several positions, and in our case, there are about 11 now, and uh, people bid for uh, these positions. There's a single bid. The highest bid gets the best position, second highest bid, the second best position, and so on, on down the line. And the amount that you have to pay for those positions uh, turn is specified as the bid of the person directly below you. Now, there's some, there's some extra twists and turns, but that's the uh, basic outline of the auction. So I thought of that as a position auction. It's like you're bidding for a place in line. And I went to the literature, and I couldn't really find anything uh, much on position auctions. There were a couple papers that, uh, that had what looked like attractive titles, but it turns out they weren't, uh, they weren't applicable to that auction form. So we, uh, once you specify the model, it's pretty easy to write down the uh, optimization conditions and then solve out for the, uh, for the set of Nash equilibria. One thing that gave me a lot of trouble is it turns out if you try to characterize the entire set of Nash equilibrium, it's pretty messy. But if you restrict yourself to a, a well-behaved subset, then it works out very cleanly. It turns out it's, it's very closely related to work that um, Roth and Sotomayor report in their two-sided matching models and work that David Gale and Sotomayor did back in the 80s, really looking at uh, incentives and assignment problems. So there's nothing new under the sun. If you look at a lot of these, uh, you can trace the intellectual history back several years. And, and yet, even today, people are publishing uh, papers attempting to characterize uh, uh, optimal auctions and various tweaks on the model. So it seems like we're not quite done yet for all the history. Yeah, there's still a lot of uh, interesting questions out there, but I think what, what's fun about mathematics and looking at these things in the abstract, two things that appear to be quite different may end up having the same mathematical structure if you can carry over work from one area into another, and that's what makes it uh, exciting to do this kind of work. Um, now, you, you have a wide-ranging interest, I know. Uh, what, what other areas of, of the Internet uh, catch your attention as having potential for game theoretic uh, uh, insights? Well, one thing that I think is uh, quite interesting these days is looking at uh, different models for intellectual property creation. I've been quite interested in the Kickstarter uh, model. It turns out in economics, uh, people refer to that structure as a provision point mechanism for public game, uh, for public goods. So the idea is creating intellectual property is very much like uh, funding a public good, and you can look at different mechanisms that could be used for public good creation. And uh, there was work. Uh, work done in the 80s about uh, using these uh, provision point mechanisms where people contribute uh, conditionally. If the sum of the contributions covers the cost of production, the project is undertaken. Otherwise, everybody gets their uh, money back. Uh, Bagnoli and Lippmann wrote a seminal paper in this area uh, in the 80s. And it's kind of fun to see here, almost 20 years later, the mechanism that was outlined there is uh, being used for uh, intellectual property creation. Well, that's, that's uh, fantastic, yeah. It's yeah. fun to see this stuff in practice, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I am waiting for my uh, Android watch uh, that is one of the Kickstarter <laughs> projects uh, there. Absolutely. I ordered one, too. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, hey, uh, Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Sure thing. Thanks a lot. And this is a, a maybe an opportunity to move to another colleague of ours, Professor yes. Amin Saberi. Yes. So I guess uh, I, for many of you who've actually played our lab exercises, you uh, may know that uh, Amin has been instrumental in, in d d d designing the interface. And uh, he and some of his students really worked on programming that and making it all possible. So. We'll hear from Amin now, and uh, we can talk a little bit about that.
And in fact, I mean, if you don't mind, besides telling us about the a uh, little bit about the software and some of the results you got, uh, you've been very active in research in the area. Maybe you could uh, just give us a hint into that research also. I mean, Saberi, we see you, but we can't hear you. How about now? Yeah, uh, we can hear you. There you go. Better. All right, great. So uh, first of all, thanks for um, inviting me here, and also. Um, I wanted to um, uh, congratulate all the students for taking advantage of this uh, great class and also for um, signing up and participating in the game theory lab. Um, uh, it's, you know, it's sort of the game theory lab is, uh, you know, this is an experiment uh, that we are running uh, to you know, understand uh, your thinking process and, you know, the way, you know, you make a decision. But at the same time, I'm hoping that you found the questions there um, intriguing and uh, uh, it helped you uh, think about game theoretic problems. So it's like part of this bigger paradigm that I try to, you know, sort of paradigm of uh, experiential learning, that, you know, you learn something uh, uh, by doing it. Um, now, so Game Theory Lab is one of the examples. I, I'm running also a couple of other labs. Um, uh, uh, another example is this um, lab that I'm running for the technology entrepreneurship class uh, that uh, another colleague of mine is teaching. Uh, so they're a, a student's team up and uh, think about a startup uh, and they work on a startup together. Um, so, um, um, uh, um, you know, I, I uh, came here to thank you for um, signing up, for participating, and also showing you um, the you know results of you know some of the you know uh, some data about uh, your own behavior on the website. Uh, so should I start with that? Sure. Yeah. Do you talk about the, the auction game, the gold mine game that they play. Yes. So if you remember, let me put that screen on. Uh, you one of the questions. Can you see the? Yes. yes. All right. Great. So one of the experiments that you participated in was a simple setup, a common value auction. So it was a first price auction with common values. So you, you, know, you, you were told that you, are, uh, you and your classmates are competing to purchase a gold mine. The value of the gold mine is a random number. Uh, so it was actually, I think, 100... Um, 37, and um, so you don't know the exact value, the, you will get a signal, a signal, a noisy signal, which is the exact value plus an error. An error is a random number chosen uniformly from minus 30 to 30. So every person gets um, uh, uh, a number. So in my case, it was 109. Now, given this noisy signal, you have to decide how much you will be bidding. Mm -hmm. And now I show you the distribution of uh, bids versus signals. Um, let me see. Can you see it? Yes, we yeah, can. Perfect. Right. So this is the distribution of uh, bids versus signals for the numbers between 100 and 200. Uh, there were bits that were below 100 or above 100, even though I had told you that the value of the gold mine is between these two numbers. But these are the more relevant bits. Um, so as you can see, there are at least three lines that are very, really, you know, like quite clear on this diagram. So first of all, um, the x-axis is the um, is the signal, and the y-axis is the bit. So the, the almost, you know, sort of 45 degree line in the middle is the set of people who uh, looked at their signal and placed a bit equal to their signal. So you see, I'll tell you, you know, sort of your noisy signal is 109. You put 109 there. So a lot of people did that. Many people put in their signal plus 30, and you can see a few people added uh, 60 to their signal. And you can also see minus 30 and a few people minus 60. Um, you can also see that uh, many people put just a number 150. 
independent of their signal. Or quite a few people just put a hundred or two hundred dollars. Now, if you do again theoretic analysis, uh, if the size of the class is large enough, um, you know, one equilibrium is for everybody to subtract uh, thirty from their signal and put uh, that value. Uh, so, I, but you know, here, as I told you, um, the um, the the value of the mines is slightly above one hundred and thirty. So there are tons of people who placed put a bit that was way above uh, the actual value of the mine. So sort of you know the person who will be winning this auction is going to end up paying a lot more than its value. And uh, I guess uh, you know this issue of the winner's curse is something that you have learned about in your class. Or uh, have you talked about the? Uh, yes, we have. Yes, and, and so indeed, it's something that's pretty endemic. Right? It takes a while for people to learn about this. And you know, it happens um, um, even in um, you know real auctions uh, when you know the you know, actually people end up paying hundreds of millions of dollars, um, and sometimes you know about the actual value. So uh, this is just one example. There were other uh, games that you participated in. I still invite you to go, and if you haven't answered all the questions, to go and answer them. Uh, we will be putting a few more games. So uh, yeah, well, one, one thing uh, you might want to point out, I, I think that maybe people wouldn't be as, as cognizant of this. And one advantage of having this large class and, and uh, the program that the mean and his uh, students have been working on is the picture you've shown is amazingly clean compared to what we usually get in terms of data. So if you have 30 students or 30 participants, it's much harder to get a picture that looks like that. So those lines coming out so clearly uh, really is a, is a nice artifact of this platform you've built. Right. So there were experiments like this uh, before, but uh, of um, most of them, by and large, they were much smaller. And you know, uh, uh, thanks to you, now we have a much better um, uh, um, data, much better data and much better understanding as a result. I mean, before we close, uh, did you want to tell us anything about your research in a words? Or it's, uh... Sure. Uh, so actually, you know, your presentations, both of your presentations could have been sort of a better pitch for my research. So, you know, I'm in the area of algorithmic game theory. And one of the problems that I'm interested in is looking at solution concepts in game theory like Nash equilibrium or market equilibrium and coming up with efficient algorithms for computing them. Uh, I'm also interested in um, game dynamics, and especially games on graphs. For example, recently uh, with my colleague, Andrea Montanari, we looked at the dynamics of um, coordination games um, over networks. So coordination games um, model situations in which uh, you have um, a higher payoff uh, if you adopt the same strategy as people around you. Uh, think about you want to choose a Windows system or a Mac system. It may be beneficial for you to choose the same operating system as your friends because it will be easier for you to exchange files or exchange tips on how to use the, your computer. Even for more consequential decisions that Matt talked about, uh, you know, whether to um, join the labor force or not, or, you know, which a political uh, or a religious uh, organization you want to join. Let's say in the United States, whether you want to be Republican or Democrat. Uh, You're talking about religion now, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so choosing the same uh, um, political party, let's say, as uh, people around you um, has a higher, uh, typically has a higher uh, payoff. It's, um, no, it's even a simpler example. You know, whether you, when, you, when you want to decide the, which side of the road you want to drive on, it's highly desirable to make this decision <laughs> as people around you. Um, so you look at this, um, you know, uh, a game on graphs where the nodes of the graph, the vertices, are uh, the agents. They, let's say they have to choose uh, between two strategies, plus one and minus one. And then uh, you look at the dynamics of the game in the sense that the individuals revise their strategy continuously uh, to increase their payoff. And then you look at, you know, you, th you think about uh, which equilibrium of the game is selected, uh, whether the dynamics converge to an equilibrium, uh, and how long does it take. 
And what we do is that we understand the relationship between the structure of the network and the convergence time. And we can drive, you know, precise uh, measures of uh, this relationship. And this is important because um, sort of uh, these models are used for a diffusion of technologies or you know, ideas or products in over a, you know, a, um, a social networking platform. So if we are, you know, by understanding this dynamics better, we can come up with better marketing strategies. So imagine you have a small uh, I mean, I, I mean, um, I'll let you finish the thoughts, and then I'll have to cut you off because we need to um, move to the interactive part. But no. please finish the uh, the thought here. No, actually, I had a sentence, so you jumped out. Uh, so uh, imagine you want to come up with a viral marketing strategy. You want to make your product viral. Um, uh, you can you can decide what's the best way to um, uh, spend your money um, to to maximize the number of people who adopt the product. Uh, so this is just one example. Uh, I'll give a, I'll pass the mic back to uh, Yob and Matt. Uh, please uh, you know, uh, keep an eye on your email. I'll be sending a couple of emails inviting you to play a few more games. And again, uh, thank you. Well, thank you, I mean, for all the work and, uh, and the research you do. Um, let's move now to you all, our, our, our students on, 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 on uh, live there. Maybe uh, starting with uh, James, you, had, you, you chatted a question that is an interesting one. Maybe you want to unmute your mic and, uh, and ask it live. First, just tell us about where you're from. Uh, sure. Um, so my name's James. I'm uh, here in San Francisco, California. Uh, I work at a startup called Servio. And uh, I deal with crowdsourcing. So uh, game theory is really important. I'm a product manager. Uh, so that's why I'm taking the class. Um, one of the things that kind of struck from what Amin was saying was uh, like the two-party system. You know, it's really frustrating to me because I, I okay, I'll, let's be honest, I always vote third party. But you know, when I talk to my friends, I can't get ever get any. No one will ever vote third party. They only want to vote for Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And so the question is, uh, how can we apply game theory to kind of break the rigidity of our electoral system? You know, and it, it really feels like a game because, and the way people conceptualize politics too is they, they say, well, I don't want to throw my vote away. I don't want to, I, I want it to count. And so it's kind of a question of how, of course, do you then get uh, the network effect to flip someone over from a, a non uh, third party doesn't count to the third party vote counting. And, and so I think politics is an interesting area for game theory. And I was just curious what you guys have done. Yeah, actually, so this is an area that's been studied quite extensively, and, and uh, two parties versus multi parties. Um, you know, the United States is, is different than, say, most European countries where there's a substantial number of parties, or actually most countries in the world. And uh, they, people have been using game theory to explain that. And in particular, a lot of it has to do with the, the idea that voters don't want to throw votes away. And in the way that the system is set up in the U.S., where you often have a representative elected just from one district, uh, you throw your vote away if you don't vote for some, one of the two main candidates. Whereas in a European or parliamentary system, often uh, you know the votes are the seats are allocated by shares of overall votes you get. So you don't end up throwing your vote away if you vote for a smaller party. They still get some say say in the parliament and and so forth. And, so political scientists have been quite interested in this. Most of the modeling now is using game theory to try and understand how voters are going to behave and how the different political systems give different incentives for parties to form. So this is exactly uh, a question that's been looked at quite a bit, and it's a fascinating one. Also in computer science, uh, computational social choice and voting fall, falls under the uh, general kind of, uh, category of social choice. It's a very active area, so if you're interested, I encourage you to uh, to, uh, to look at that. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, please do mute your mic. Uh, who would like to speak up uh, now? Please raise your hand and we'll call on you. Um, so, Nabube, uh, did you have anything you wanted to bring up? You were there first on the call. You get first dibs. Uh, in fact, I didn't have any question, and I didn't raise my hand, but I just wanted to ask something. Um, but tell us where you're from. 
Uh, I told you, I think. I'm yeah, from Iran. You didn't, you didn't tell the other <laughs> tens of thousands of people. <laughs> okay. I'm from Iran, but I live in Sydney. I'm a Sydney University student, PhD student. I'm working on a problem which I can model um, as a combinatorial auction. So I was looking for some material more on auctions, but the course just ended <laughs> at the beginning of auction. So I want to know if there is any game theory number two course covering interesting materials and auctions. Adrian, do you mind going uh, to my bookshelf and pulling uh, the... I have your book. <laughs> no, but not everybody else does on combinatorial auction. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so as you know, in a, in a way, you know, there's been a lot of work on combinatorial auctions, uh, and uh, and we have the the book about it. Um, but to answer your question, will be follow up to the course. Um, um, you know, I'm inclined to say uh, probably yes. Yeah. We're extending it. We want to first learn from this experience because this, in a sense, is very foundational, very basic basis of, of, of game theory. We're sure we can improve on it. And once we have a stable basis, we'd like to make it a platform so that many other more specialized components can be added, for example, combinatorial options. Okay. Um, who else would just like to speak, speak up? Thank just you. Thank you so much for, for the very great course that you provided for us for free. Our, our pleasure. You know, you, know, you know the phrase, uh, free and worth every penny. <laughs> By the way, here is the book called Combinatorial Auctions, especially if you read it in the right direction. <laughs> um, who else would like to speak? Please, now's the time. Uh, by the way, um, uh, Professor Varian, I uh, would love to hear some more from you. I was just going to, uh, just a second here, let's see. There, I was just going to cite uh, Duverger's law, which says if you have a uh, plurality voting system, you'll end up with a two-party uh, outcome. Uh, it's a kind of interesting uh, set of reasoning and empirical uh, data from political science that reflects on the question that was asked just a couple minutes ago. Can, can you repeat the author's name again? D-U-R-V-E-R, -E just a second. I'm sorry, D-U-V-E-G-E-R. You can start with the Wikipedia entry and go on from there. Is there a reason to go on from there? <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of scholarly articles that are published. <laughs> uh, folks, uh, don't be bashful with this. Andre or uh, Colin or Demetrius or Julia or Nise that has no picture. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can also chat it in. Now's your time. Uh, yeah. okay. Go ahead. I think that is Andre. Please unmute and speak. OK. Do you hear me? Very yes. well, and we see you too. Where are you from, Andre? Uh, uh, I'm from Ukraine, uh, Kiev. I work in uh, Institute of Organic Chemistry. No, you can see that. <laughs> uh, yes, we do. <laughs> uh, so, first of all, I should thank you very much for the course. It was really uh, very interesting for me because uh, I was just interested in it maybe from my childhood when I read some book about... Uh, and I remember the tables of the normal fo form games. Uh, and uh, my question was about the payoffs. So, uh, when we just model such games, we um, the, first, uh, the first place is the payoff uh, which we get in some or other situation. And uh, uh, if, for example, I'm uh, in real life choosing a notebook, for example, and I don't really know about my pay of anything uh, if I choose uh, one or another model, how can I uh, just solve this problem? What a great question. Um, so, do you want to <laughs> take a stab? Well, I think it's it's not an easy one to answer, right? It's it, it's something that the the theory takes as somewhat of a primitive, and, but it's important to know exactly what's get fold, what gets folded into the payoffs. And obviously, the game analysis is very sensitive to these things. So, so part of it's just being aware of when the game's sensitive to changes in payoffs and when it's not. And, uh, 
it means that one has to be really careful in applying these things. And remember that uh, even before we get to payoff, you know, when, you know, where do the numbers come from already arise in probability theory and in probability we have an answer. If you're an objectivist, you can look at uh, frequencies and try to distill it from that, but if you're uh, uh, but if you're not an objectivist, then if you're subjectivist, then uh, you're back to the, the question. And uh, for utilities, it's, it's 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 even harder because you don't have the frequencies to work with. Now, there is a literature on uh, you, on, on preference elicitation, and I would encourage you to look at that. Um, a series of questions you can get to to have a sense for one's true utility uh, uh, function. Um, there's a famous uh, book by Keeney and Rafa on multi-attribute uh, utility. More recently, there's computational models of how to elicit preferences with a fairly small number of uh, queries. There's also uh, debates even about whether we have utility functions or whether this is just a useful construct. So uh, some of the neuroeconomics literature has been pushing pushing the frontier there and trying to figure out what's actually going on in our brains when we're making decisions and uh, how we should model uh, the human behavior in these ways. Remember that uh, that uh, in game theory, generally in, in the Bayesian framework, uh, usually the exact numbers aren't that important because the strategic situation is not impacted if you perturb all the payoffs by a positive affine transformation that is multiplied by a positive constant or add to it any constant. But mm -hmm. still, the play as, uh, other than that, the, play, the, the game is very sensitive. So it's a very good question. Um, Hal, I, I don't want to impose on you, but do you happen to have uh, something you want to say on this topic? Maybe not. It was just interesting for me to, to hear uh, how uh, mathematicians are uh, dealing with such a problem or sensitivity to the utility function, which is uh, generally unknown. Well, I could expand on something Matt said, uh, I think, or Matt alluded to, and that is uh, it's a good idea to check for robustness. So just start out with something that seems like a reasonable guess. Look at what the strategic implications are, the outcome of the game, and then try to perturb uh, either your payoff numbers or your uh, the other players pay off numbers and see where the uh, where the game changes uh, the outcome. So in many cases, uh, there will be a uh, robust. There will often be a robust solution that's not uh, terribly sensitive to the exact numbers. Now, beside the online course, there's some other courses with. Small number of students. Yes, you need to attend to. So yeah, I have a lecture in a few minutes across campus. So. I'm going to have to uh, say goodbye now and uh, thank everybody for coming and attending this morning. So I'll leave you out to wrap things up this morning. Uh, well, somebody care. needs to do the dirty work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Take care. Matt, see you later. Bye, folks. All right. Um, we probably will be uh, winding down soon anyway, uh, but uh, does anybody else there uh, want to say anything? Uh, don't be bashful. This is your time. Your one uh, moment of fame. You should uh, check out Colin's question in the chat. Uh, let's see, Colin. I guess I mentioned calculating the utility of investing in. A, in the, okay, let me read it out. I am interested in calculating the utility for the investment a company should make in R and D in order to reduce churn while optimizing the investment. Specifically, how much money should a cellular operator invest in network engineering? to maximize revenue. Do you know of any good sources for this analysis? Um, I do not know of any academic uh, work. The, not that it doesn't exist. I'm sure it does exist. I just don't uh, not sufficiently knowledgeable to know. I have uh, uh, anecdotal personal uh, data there, but I, I, I personally don't uh, have uh, uh, knowledge of academic research in this area. Uh, do either Amin or Hal Varian uh, have an answer to this question, namely optimal investment in R&D, specifically by a cellular uh, company? I think the answer is no. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Sorry, uh, but 
Honesty is my best ally. Um, Actually, let me say goodbye um, before I get more questions I can't answer. Um, I also have a class to attend to. Um, okay, I mean, thanks again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, folks, uh, I think with this uh, we'll uh, wind it down. Uh, and thank you all very much for your participation, both here in the online chats, uh, if you're viewing uh, on the website, uh, later on YouTube, and in general participation in class. Again, this has really been a very exciting experiment for us, and uh, we look to learn from it and repeat. And uh, goodbye to you all for now.